afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of BDO's Kidney Talks. My name is Suna Halley, and I am a program manager at the GW Liver and Pancreas Institute for Quality. Um, today's Kidney Talk is sponsored by the GW Ron and Joy Paul Kidney Center, MOTEP, the Minority Tissue and Transplant Education Program, the Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church, and of course, BlackDoctor.org. Today's presentation should be very interesting. We'll be discussing kidney terms that every patient should know. Our amazing presenter is going to be Dr. Keith Melanson, the Chief of Transplantation at the George Washington University Hospital. On our panel for today is Dr. Clive Callender, who is a professor of surgery and also the founder of the Minority Tissue and Transplant Education Program. So please get your questions ready, sit back and enjoy the webinar. Dr. Melanson, take it away. Thank you, Suna. It is uh, always a pleasure to be here. Uh, of course, uh, it's always great to be with the great uh, Dr. Callender, and um, and I'm glad that you're here as well, Suna. And we and hopefully this will be an engaging talk that will get the public to ask us a lot of questions uh, about kidney disease and what leads to kidney disease and what ways you should know you might be developing kidney disease. I just got a little grab bag of some of the more common terms because these are the things that, uh, the sort of things that people always ask me out in, in the public. So I figured it would be a good opportunity to discuss these specific terms. And then, you know, like I said, open it up to questions and see what the audience uh, might have to ask. So um, uh, with that, let's have the presentation. We'll go to the first slide. It's always important to stay hydrated. Um, this is espresso. I, I do drink espresso, but uh, water is the most important fluid. Um, all right, so here you go. Kidney terms everyone should know. Next slide. All right, we're going to start with GFR. This is the popular one. This is what everybody wants to understand. What is GFR? Okay, here you go. It stands for glomerular filtration rate. And what you need to understand about your kidneys is that interspersed throughout that entire organ, and remember, your kidneys about, I have a, a little model right here, right? This is your kidney. It's about the size of your fist. So this kidney, uh, well, actually, this is a liver. Oh, I just realized, but it's a liver. But anyway, the kidney is about the size of your fist, okay? And um, so if you put your fist up, that's the normal size of your kidney interspersed all throughout that kidney are these tiny little engines called glomerulus. And in, when we're in medical school, we learn to look under a microscope and see what a glomerulus looks like. And it looks like a little ball of spaghetti. And the spaghetti are the little vessels. And that's how blood goes into into the kidney and then urine is pulled out of the blood. Liquid is pulled out of the blood and then out as urine, okay? So the GFR stands for how well those little engines inside your kidney are working. Now, um, you have thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands of these little factories that work nonstop inside your kidney. And as long as they are healthy and working well, there's, you're not gonna have any problems with, with kidney disease. But when people start to develop kidney disease, usually what's happening is the glomeruli are diseased in some way. And when you look under the microscope, you can see the disease. The glomeruli start to die. So what you're measuring by a blood test you can actually measure how well the glomeruli are working because the better your, your um, kidneys are filtering the junk, the uh, pollutions in your blood, it gives us an estimate of how well the glomeruli are actually working. It would be like um, every day driving down your street and determining how well the the garbage workers are doing their job just by looking at the amount 
of trash cans that have not been emptied. That's how we in medicine, by looking at the blood, can tell how well the G, how well the 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 kidneys are working because you should have very little deb- debris left in your blood as your kidneys chug through your um, your blood through the out um, the blood through the kidney and then urine out um, through your bladder. So a bigger person is naturally going to have a little bit more debris than uh, a smaller person. You know, muscle mass matters because muscle is one of the main instruments of producing lots of toxins. Muscles are good, but they also produce more toxins and therefore you need better kidney function, the more muscular that you are. So here I basically said that it's a blood test and it measures how well your kidneys are functioning. And uh, normal GFR will vary by your age, because we all will lose some glomerular function over time. Sex, men tend to have bigger kidneys. They also tend to have more muscle. And, and like I said, everything declines with age. So the magic number, if there's a magic number, the magic number is nine zero. Okay. Now that's interesting. Anyone that's ever looked at their lab reports might might have recognized the fact that a lot of lab reports will report your GFR as normal if it's greater than 60. And that's not really accurate because, uh, you know, a GFR of 60 is, is, is okay. I mean, it's pretty good, but it's not normal for most uh, people if you're, you know, middle age or younger. Right. So um, you want your GFR to be 90 to be total or, or above, you know, 100 you know, to be totally normal. And um, and so that would be a question to ask your provider is if you could be tested to determine exactly how high is your GFR. And the reason why I, I stress that is because there are five stages of kidney disease. And the first two stages of kidney disease, your GFR can still be pretty high. So you want to know if there's a change in your GFR, right? Because a change from from a year to year could connote something starting to go wrong. But you wouldn't know that if you're just looking at um, um, a test that maxes out at 60. In other words, if you go from a GFR in, in tw- say, say in 2020, your GFR was 85. Okay, it's 85. But if you, you got a test that maxes out at 60, it'll say greater than 60. And then in 2022, your GFR dropped from 85 to 65 again your test is maxing out at 60. You wouldn't even realize there's a 20 point drop in your GFR. And that's important to know. And you know, when you have early changes in kidney, in your kidney function, that's when it's most easily treated. Unfortunately, Dr. Callender will tell you that most patients, that's not when they get diagnosed with kidney problems. They get diagnosed later, and the and the later you get diagnosed, later meaning the the more your kidney function has declined, and the more your kidney failure or or chronic kidney disease has progressed, the more of a problem it is. So you want to catch this sort of stuff early. Preventative medicine is the best medicine. Prophylactic medicine is the best medicine. In other words, you want to make sure you're doing the right things before anybody tells you there's a problem. Next slide. All right. So what is CKD? CKD is chronic kidney disease. I've had numerous patients that have come to me. And remember, I'm a transplant surgeon. So is Dr. Callender. So when we are seeing patients, they're usually already diagnosed. They're usually at the end of the road. That's why they're seeing a transplant surgeon. 
We're not primary care physicians. Now, of course, Dr. Callender has made his career in is, is in trying to make us be better at primary care, right? So, so although we are tertiary, quaternary care, he, with his organization, MOTEP, what he has done is to try to get people to understand very early in the process if they are at risk of things like kidney disease. And that's why in the Ron and Joy Paul Kidney Center, we brought in MOTEP in order to help us do what he has done so effectively his, his entire career. So the reason why I say that here is I've had numerous patients that, you know, I, I can go back and look in their chart and I'm, and I'm seeing in the diagnosis CKD. Mm -hmm. And the patient's coming to me and saying, I just found out I had kidney disease. I just found out, oh, I, I was so surprised. I, I went to the emergency room and um, and they told me I need to start dialysis. And I go back in the last five years, somebody's been putting CKD in their chart. So why is it that the doctors or the healthcare providers have diagnosed this person with a problem that the person doesn't know they have? You know, and I put the blame on both parties, uh, but the issue is knowing what is in your chart. Now, given the way things are today, there's no excuse. I mean, everybody, uh, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but most of us who uh, go to the doctor, you have the ability to go into my chart and it's different at different hospitals, but you can go in and see your own test results. You can go in and see the notes from the doctors. You can go in and see the diagnosis that they've put into your charts. And you should be doing that. You should know everything about what the doctors are putting in your chart. Because to be quite frank, sometimes erroneous stuff is put into people's charts and you wanna find it, right? Um, I can give you some hilarious and ironic and um, uh, examples, but I'm not, I'm not gonna give them all right now, but you know, I can tell you later. But the point is CKD stands for chronic kidney disease and it's a problem. Okay, let me say that again, chronic, Kidney disease is a problem. No one should ever tell you, oh, you got, yeah, you, uh, it's okay, or you're fine, or it's not a big deal. It's a big deal, okay? If somebody's put CKD in your chart, it's a problem because most CKD progresses, all right? I just said that there were five stages of kidney disease. The first two stages, uh, most people miss. So you're usually getting diagnosed at stage three. And stage three is a precarious situation because you're right on the fence. You're right on the border of no return. Because once you get to stage four, that's it. That's, once you get to stage four, you are going to progress to end stage renal disease, which we'll talk about. But and, 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 and um, end stage renal disease means you need to be on dialysis usually. And that's what everybody hates. They hate the concept of being on dialysis. But what should be happening is you should get diagnosed a lot earlier. So CKD means you have some kidney dysfunction. So remember, I told you a normal GFR is, is 90. Once you get below that, then you've got CKD, right? I mean, unless you're 80 years old, your GFR should not be below 90, right? So if as, you see, as, as your GFR drops, then you get branded with this CKD. Uh, moniker. Now, what can happen is no one may have discussed this with you. Your physician or provider may not have, they, 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 the computer may generate this as a diagnosis um, in the chart. You know, computers do this kind of thing. And with artificial intelligence, it's only going to get worse, right? Um, I just hope computers can't start operating anytime soon. I, I got to keep my job for at least another 20 years to pay for these kids. But anyway, let's not get into my problems. See, Dr. Callen is good. I mean, Dr. Callender's kids are all grown up and he, they've made it through college and law school and whatever, but I still have some, uh, some college tuition. Uh, but AI and these computers, these fancy computers, they'll just automatically generate this, put it into the bill, and, um, and there you go. So you can have this diagnosis and no one may have the, in, in detail have discussed this with you, right? But CKD is a problem. You need to be asking a lot of questions. And really what you should do 
if I was you, this is what I would do. If they, if somebody put CKD on my chart, then I want to see a CKD specialist. <laughs> it, 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 I'm done having conversations with primary care doctors. I need somebody that can talk to me about CKD. And that would be a kidney doctor, a nephrologist, right? You need to see a specialist, all right? And one of the, you know, we see these divergent paths that people with good insurance and, uh, and higher income travel and people that don't have good insurance and private, in, uh, I mean, yeah, good insurance and, and high income. And one of the early divergence, uh, divergent points is how quickly you see a specialist, all right? And specialist care when you need it, you know, because we're really good about this in America, to be honest. This is one of the things in our medical system that we're probably better than the rest of the world. And that's in super duper subspecialized medicine, right? So for you know, for your heart surgeries, for your brain surgeries, for your transplant surgeries, this is the place to be, right? Where we don't do a good job is in the primary care, catching things early, you know, um, women having babies, um, pediatrics, these sorts of things. I, look, before some pediatrician calls in angry, I'm not saying we don't have good pediatricians. I'm just saying that when you compare America to the world, the world, um, the civilized world outside of America does a better job with primary care than we do. So since our specialists are so good, we should utilize them. And, and that means if you get branded as having CKD, you need to see a kidney doctor. All right. And chronic kidney disease means you got a disease, you got a problem and, and, and you need to be taking up certain strategies to preserve your kidney function. Right. And, and usually that means if you have diabetes, you need to not have diabetes. You need to be trying to treat your diabetes. If you have high blood pressure, you need to make it normal. Right. It's not rocket science. Right. That's why I love medicine. It's not complicated. It's very linear. But, you know, when you got a problem, you got to fix it. OK, we, and we'll get to some of the causes later. Next slide. All right. In stage renal disease. All right. Now, this is the point of no return. Right. Remember, I told you once you get to, to CKD4, you're headed to ESRD and that's CKD5. And CKD5, which is in stage renal disease, means your kidneys are, are, are not being able to keep up anymore. You, you, you now have so much kidney disease that you need help. And, um, and without that help, you would die. So that help is either going to be dialysis, and there are a few types of ways you could get dialysis. Hemodialysis, either at home or in a center. Most people go to a center. Or peritoneal dialysis, which is usually at home with a machine that clears your, your, um, your blood overnight. So... Um, that is the point of no return, and it's very unfortunate. And uh, in the United States, we've got over a million people that have that have CKD. You know, that there are millions, actually it's millions of people with chronic kidney disease, unfortunately, if you take all the all the different um, stages. And uh, with end-stage renal disease, you got over a half a million people. So six, seven hundred thousand people in this country are on dialysis. There are millions of people that have um, CKD, you know, about 10 million people. So there's a lot of people with CKD, and we only do about 25,000 kidney transplants per year. So it is, it is a huge problem once you get to end-stage renal disease because your life is so very much shortened when you don't have kidneys that function well, which is why you want to do everything in your power to avoid it. And you can avoid it even when you get diagnosed with CKD. And I hope that's the take home message today if, is that if you have early kidney disease, it's not the end of the world. But, dude, you need to be waking up. You know, it's like the end of that Spike Lee movie for all you Spike Lee fans. Um, not uh, you see, what was it called? Um, um, not do the right thing. Uh, what was the one with all the fraternities? Um, sooner. Did you see it? You know, uh, school days. That's right. School days. So at the end of school days, the, Lar the, Lar the Larry Fishburn, uh, Fishburn um, character says, wake up. Remember, he screams it out. Wake up. Well, that's what you need to do. If you've been diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, you need to wake up. 
And by the way, Suna got that right because she is a member of the Divine Nine. Um, I think she's a Zeta. Yeah, yeah, she's a Zeta. Yeah, I'm just joking. I'm just joking, Suna. I, I know you're not a Zeta. Um, she is an AKA. But all right, moving on. Let's go to uh, the next slide. Uh, Dr. Callender is a member of the Divine Nine as well. Um, he didn't make it into Kappa Alpha Psi, so I think he's another one of those other fraternities. But anyway, next slide. Creatinine. I get this question all the time. And I'm sure you get it as well, Dr. Callender. What is creatinine? Again, remember earlier in the talk, I, I was talking about how the more muscle you have, the more um, waste products that are, are produced. And creatinine is one of those waste products. And this comes from, you know, eating protein. And it also comes down from, comes from your own breakdown of creatinine. And it's a great way to look at the function of, of your kidneys because it's easily measured in your blood and your creatinine should stay at a normal rate, no matter how much meat you eat, no matter how um, rigorous of an exercise that you will complete. Like you can imagine, if you go out and run a marathon, you're going to get a lot of creatinine generated in your blood just from all of the muscle breakdown. But someone with a normal kidney, they're just going to flush it out. But it's one of the reasons why when you're doing very rigorous exercises, particularly when you're getting dehydrated, your urine starts to darken. Well, that's because of the creatinine that's being generated. Okay, so it's normal to have creatinine in the blood and um, and you're always going to have some. But the better your kidneys work, the lower the creatinine is going to be. So what is a normal creatinine? Well, normal creatinine is going to vary based on how big you are, right? So a big muscular person, you know, someone who's six foot six and uh, 250 pounds, uh, a creatinine of 1.4 would be perfectly normal. But that's a huge male. And then if you have a woman who is, you know, five foot two and 90 pounds, well, for her to have a creatinine of 1.4 is going to be a problem. Right. So that's why I say don't focus on the number because that number is is it, it, it's variable, number one. And then number two, it, it, it's all subjective, you know, based on uh, on how large you are. So um, you, you look at the creatinine, but then you also have to look at the GFR and they both need to coincide. So you would want to have a nice low creatinine, a number like one point zero or, or zero point nine and a GFR, which takes into account your size, a GFR greater than 90. So if you got a low creatinine and a, and, a, and a high GFR, then you have normal kidney function. But here's the, the rub, and I, I mentioned this earlier. You still need to be uh, monitoring what your numbers are doing, because I guarantee you the doctors will often miss this. In other words, if you've got a creatinine that's still in the normal zone. However, it's increased. That's that's something to take note of. Same thing with GFR. So, like I said, last year your your GFR was ninety five, and this year it's eighty five. Last year your 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 um, creatinine was zero point eight. This year it's one point two. But all those numbers are in the normal range. But the but you're moving in the wrong direction. And when you're moving in the wrong direction, it could be a benign reason, but you never assume it's a benign reason. You need to, you need to get confirmation. And the only confirmation would be to have tests repeated, to hydrate, maybe change some things. And, and sometimes what you need to change is some of the things that could be harmful to your kidneys. You know, um, I, I've said on this show before, I have four um, boys and, you know, they all are athletes and they all work out and they all like to take supplements. You know, I've been through this all with every single one of them and um, and, and and protein and protein shakes and powders can be safe, but they can be unsafe, too. So you always need to be mindful of how much of that stuff you're taking um, creatine which sounds and looks kind of like creatinine. Creatine is a, a supplement that a lot of young uh, bodybuilders like to take or people, young athletes like to take. 
And uh, and again, it can be safe in small amounts with a lot of water, but it can be a problem as well. So you got to be mindful of all that. People have this misconception if they get something from the health food store or from the uh, vitamin store, it's somehow healthy. I mean, you know, I remember um, a, a gentleman telling me once that um, marijuana is good for you because it comes, it's a weed. It, God created it. It comes out of the earth. And I explained to him, I was like, you realize like any medicine you can think of it comes out of there. It comes from a plant usually. So that that's erroneous to believe that all these herbs and vitamins are somehow healthy just because they're vitamins or herbs are natural. No, don't don't believe that because, uh, oh, oh, now I'm gonna quote something else, Suna, um, Public Enemy. Uh, don't believe the hype. Don't, I, that was before your time, Suna, but that was a great song. So, you know, you got to understand um, that you, what is healthy is what's healthy for you, right? So for you, taking a certain supplement may not be working well. It may interact with some of your other medications. And that's the other thing. Happened to my own, I've, I've said this on the show before, happened to my own mother. Taking herbal medicine in place of doctor medicine, right? Somebody, somebody thinks, oh, well, the, the doctor wants me to take this stuff, you know, that comes from industry and the man or whatever. But I'm going to not take that and take what I have now um, gone and bought in the health food store. My mom, a registered nurse, a brilliant woman, um, she is my mom, uh, but decided she was going to do that with her blood pressure medicine, and it was not. It was not good. That 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 did not end well for her. Her blood pressure was not well treated with herbal medicine. Um, so she's fine today, but she did have a heart attack before she learned. So um, I, I hope that this message gets out there because I know there's a lot of that in the community. But um, and, I, and look, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not a big supporter of the pharmaceutical industry, but I'm telling you, if a doctor is telling you you need a medicine for a certain reason, then here's the experiment you could do if you want. And that's what I tell my patients. Well, if what you think works for your blood pressure works better than the medicine that the doctor check, um, gave you, well, then do a simple experiment. Check your blood pressure on your herbal medicine. And if it's working, then fine, then I'm wrong. But if it's not, then you're wrong, right? So you got to do the, that's what my mom didn't do. She didn't do the experiment. She just started taking the herbal medicine thinking she was going to be fine. She wasn't. But anyway, that's creatinine. Uh, and like I said, we could talk about talk uh, more about it in a second. All right, next slide. BUN. This is another one that people see and, 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 and wonder. And this is blood urea nitrogen. And this is part of the interface between the kidney and the liver. Because, you know, you, you have this, this, this nexus, this network in your body. You got the heart, the kidney, and the liver. The heart and the kidney are two pumps, and the liver and the kidney are the two filters. Uh, the liver has an additional uh, additional function that it's the master um, uh, assembler of the body. The liver is taking all this stuff and putting it together in certain ways for metabolism, anabolism, all this stuff. Your liver is not working well. You, you, you are really in, in, having a big, big problem. But your liver is taking fats from the blood and, and, and organizing them into like um, micelles and into cholesterol and, and lipids and all that kind of stuff. And it's taking proteins and un, undoing them from one, one type of protein, turning them into another. But your liver's doing all this fancy stuff. And then it excretes toxins into the blood that goes into the kidney. And then the kidney urinates it out. And they, they work together. And BUN is one of the things that you will see. It's kind of like what we were talking about with creatinine or about the garbage men coming and you can tell that they're cleaning the street every day. Well, if, if your BUN should stay at a pretty low number, a normal BUN would be like 10, 12, something like that. And if your BUN is starting to go up, then that means something is awry. Um, it could be kidneys. But it also could be liver. 
okay? Or you could have some other GI problem. But your BUN should be in the normal range. And one of the fastest way for your BUN to go up out of the normal range is to be dehydrated. So a high BUN with a normal creatinine tells us that you're probably just dehydrated. But it's another number that you can look at to determine normal kidney and liver function. Next slide. Hypertension. Okay. Again, I always like to bring this up whenever I give a talk, but what is high blood pressure? I recently was in Louisiana um, for a funeral. And um, once again, you know, I have to talk to everybody at the funeral and hear all of their medical problems. Uh, but I was surprised at the fact that most people still don't get what, don't get it. You know, um, I'm talking to many of my cousins. I have a huge family in, in down in Louisiana, good people, all of them. Uh, Louisiana is God's country, and uh, you gotta love gotta love all the people down there. Um, they 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 don't eat the healthiest though, to be honest. Uh, and it's good food. I mean, it's the best in the world, but it's not it's not that healthy. So I'm talking to all my cousins, friends, and everybody, and 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 invariably half of them have high blood pressure. So I'm talking to to them about high blood pressure, and I'm like, okay, um, are you, you so you're you're getting your blood pressure treated? Okay, all right. Well, how's it running? What's, what's your blood pressure? What, 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 how's it running? Oh, it's fine. Yeah, no, it's good. My doctor, my doctor said everything's fine. Yeah, 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 I understand. But what's the number? What's the number? Just I need, I need the number. Oh, oh, you know, oh, it's like um, this morning it was like 150 over 50 over 95. Oh, 150 over 95. Oh, yeah, yeah. Guess what? That's high. That's high. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, you, you, you need something else. Oh, I know you're taking your medicine. Yeah, I, I understand. I understand. But you need more. You know, I mean, people don't get it. So I, I tell everybody, what's a normal blood pressure? That top number shouldn't be above 140. The bottom number should not be above 90. And and Dr. Calendar will tell you, this is being liberal. Because, you know, most doctors think that your number should be a good bit lower than this. They should not be really, they would say 130 as the high for systolic and, and 80 should be the high for, for diastolic, right? So if you're above 149, you're really, you're, I mean, this is treatable range, which is why I put it on here. This is, you need treatment. You know, you can do funny things, you know, funny things meaning weight loss, exercise, um, when you're right at the borderline. But what when you're, when you're this high, you need treatment. And I, I, I will tell my patients and my family, look, I get that you're gonna change your diet, I get that you're going to exercise and that you can get your blood pressure lower. And you may have done it in the past. I get that. But there's no reason to take the risk while you get there. In other words, take get the medicine, take the medicine, get your blood pressure down, but start the diet change. Decrease the salt in your diet. Um, exercise. Decrease the fat in your diet. And then your blood pressure will continue to go down. And then you won't need the blood pressure medicine anymore. And then you, you can stop taking it. But there's no reason to play Russian roulette because stroke, heart attack, these sort of things that can happen to people can, can occur while your blood pressure is high. And it doesn't have to be. People think, oh, the, the stroke range is really big. Yeah, that's true that a very high blood pressure increases your risk even more. But a just over the, the cutoff blood pressure is increasing your risk as well. So walking around with a 150 blood pressure thinking I'm just over the cutoff is exactly the wrong way to think about it, okay? So um, so yeah, high blood pressure continues to be the number one biggest problem, health problem in this country. And I just read an article the other day, it's the number one biggest health problem in the world, right? We need to get people to understand this and 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 like i said i just came back from louisiana and i was i was frankly appalled that people still just don't get it high blood pressure is a problem next slide and this is the other one diabetes right the twin terrors diabetes and high blood pressure diabetes is a is a big problem and again i and i i have actually gotten on physicians about this telling patients oh yeah oh it looks like you got a little bit of an issue there with your your sugar control you may be becoming maybe pre-diabetic or whatever 
So what does the patient hear when you tell them something like that? Ah, I'm okay. I'm good. Yeah, I, I might have a little, you know, they, they're not hearing that they are becoming diabetic. They're not hearing what goes along with what that doctor just told them. You know, metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes. This means you got a problem. You have a problem. You, you have a diagnosis. You need to make changes affirmatively. One of my cousins, this was a few years ago, and, and uh, he did a great job, was diagnosed with prediabetes. And this guy got it. He immediately called me in a panic. He couldn't believe it because he thought he was really healthy and, um, and, and told me his numbers. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. This is a problem. And this is what you need to do. And he immediately changed his diet, immediately started exercising. And, and within a couple of months, his numbers had totally normalized. His blood sugars were normal. His hemoglobin A1C dropped from 6.3 down to 4.9. Okay. So it's possible to do it, but you've got to make changes, right? The hardest thing to change in your life is your diet, to be honest. It's, it's the hardest because you have to eat every day. You know, if you like to smoke crack, you can stop smoking crack. You don't need it every day, right? Your body's going to crave it for a while. It's going to crave it for a while, but then you're not, you, know, you don't need crack anymore. you got to eat every day, right? So since you have to eat every day, then this is a daily struggle. We all struggle with it, right? So diabetes is a, is a big, big problem. There's an epidemic in this country, and um, your blood sugar should never, ever, ever be above 120. If you're normal, your blood, your blood I don't care if you just sat down and ate a whole chocolate cake. Your blood sugar is not going to go higher than 120. Because you're normal, because your insulin is working, you you know you you just you know you can finish the cake and then take a blood take a, a, a test. Your blood sugar should be normal, and if it's jumping up really high, even if it comes down, then it's your your um your axis, your insulin to sugar axis is off, and that's the beginning of type two diabetes. That's what type two diabetes is. It, it just means that your insulin is not being released. It's not as sensitive to the sugar, the amount of sugar you're taking in. The body's great. You know, our bodies are phenomenal instruments, right? They, 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 they can take a, a huge amount of um, toxins and, and, and insult over time and still function well. But, you know, what you're seeing from these chronic diseases is that over time, over and over and over, these insults will eventually take their toll, which is why you want to get ahead of things. You know, you, 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 you used to be a smoker. Okay. All right. That was bad. Stop, stop. And then start living a different sort of life. You used to be overweight. Okay. Stop. You lose the weight and you live a healthy kind of life. You know, you want, you want to get into healthy habits and then years later, you are, you are different. You know, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. You know, as a person of color, I see patients that are older oftentimes in my clinic, 60s, 70s. 60s don't seem that old anymore as I get, as I get a little bit older, <laughs> to be honest. But, um, but 60s, 70s, 80s. And people, I mean, Dr. Callender would be the exception to the rule in the sense that he is of color, but very, very healthy. And, I, and I, I'm, by this, I don't mean, you know, people talk about chocolate don't crack. I'm not talking about that. I'm like, this man has led a life that's brought him health in his 80s, right? And that's what you want. So what, what I was going to say, as a person of color, it I, I see lots of patients that are in their seventh and eighth, even ninth decade of life, and they're all, they, they, they can be very healthy. Like, surprise, I just saw a lady in clinic, um, Asian lady, you know, who's in her 70s and looked like she could be in her... Um, 50s, right? So what I'm saying is, unfortunately for us, those people that are exceedingly healthy late in life tend not to be people of color, unfortunately. Why? Because all of these things I'm telling you about, being overweight, having diabetes early in life, having high blood pressure and not getting it adequately treated, it takes a toll on your body over time. Right. Even though they can be asymptomatic over time, it takes its toll on your body and people that. And, and, and again, some of this is is um, can be tethered to socioeconomics because good preventative care, a good insurance, 
seeing these sort of doctors that are, are getting ahead of things, that's going to be easier done at, um, at, at the higher income ranges. However, you know what else is done differently at the higher income ranges? People less likely are trying to kill themselves. And how, and how do you try to kill yourself? Drug abuse, smoking cigarettes, being way overweight. You know, again, I don't want to insult anyone. All I'm saying is the, the, the prescription to a healthy life is what, you know, Dr. Callender always says, love yourself, take care of yourself, all that stuff. He's absolutely right. You, you've got to decide early in life, um, I want to be healthy. I want to be healthy not only today, I want to be healthy 30 years from now. But anyway, all right, next slide. Obesity. We got a big problem in America. <laughs> you know, that's it's kind of ironic, big problem. But obesity is a big, big issue, right? People are overweight. One of the first things that strikes you when you travel is that Americans are fat. You know, I mean, when you go to Europe, I mean, you're, I, 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 you know, I go to Italy, you walk the streets of Italy and you realize, wow, people are really thin. And then you see somebody that's a little big and you're like, oh, 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 oh well, there you go. That's a, that's a bigger person. And then you realize that's an American. You know, I, I mean, you know, I mean, we are overweight. And I'm taking, I'm putting myself in the category, I mean, meaning that I struggle with this as well. I mean, you know, so I'm, I, I'm not saying just y'all. We, we we need to do better. We need to be smaller. We need to do th the things that people in other countries do. They do a lot more walking than 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 we do. They do a lot more bike riding than than we do. They eat small meals, right? I mean, if, if you've ever been to Italy and gotten a plate of spaghetti, and compared that to <laughs> to what a plate of spaghetti looks like from a restaurant in the United States, you realize real quick that we have a different way of eating, you know, and whereas they, they, they will stay and, and eat a meal for hours and they're eating like little things, you know, Oh, let me get a little bit of pasta. Oh, let me have this little piece of meat. Oh, let me have just little, little salad. You know, I saw a presentation the other day and it was just on the calories in a typical American salad, salad, right? And, and it was all about the dressings that Americans put on this. They might as well eat a Big Mac. I mean, the, the, the way that they put salad dressing, I, I, I've watched this in the cafeteria. Well, people have taken, um, you know, Thousand Island dressing and ranch dress. I mean, you might as well, I'm like, you know, don't, why, why kill that lettuce with all that? Just, just get a Big Mac. I mean, it, it would be less calories, honestly. So obesity is a problem. I'm making light of it, but it, it is a it is a big issue. Um, now I don't know because I, I have seen some miraculous things happen with these new medications, you know. And and from what I understand, Medicare, Medi uh, or at least Medicare is 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 thinking about um, covering these medicines. And and I know it's making a big change in a lot of people's lives. So um, so we we have to see, but we've got to do a better job. Um, Americans need to lose weight. So what is body mass index? And we'll talk about that, I think, in the next slide. But if you have a BMI over 30, you are obese. All right. That's it. Now, I know people will say, Dr. Melanson, hasn't it been proven that depending on your ethnic, your ethnic group, if you're African-American or Hispanic, that um, these BMI um, calculations are not quite accurate. And, and I would say yes. But I'd also say, and, and, and I got Dr. Callender here as my witness, isn't it ironic that the same group of people that wanted GFR to be changed because we didn't, we thought that it was wrong to say we had more muscle than, than white people. When we start talking about BMI, we want to say, well, we got more muscle, therefore our BMI. I mean, I just think it's kind of ironic, right? You you want it both ways, but my point my point is, you know, BMI over thirty is obese, plain and simple. And yes, if you are benching three hundred fifty pounds every day, then yes, all that muscle is is heavier, so you got a good argument. But if you're not, you're obese, and you need to be making a change. 
Anyway, moving on. Moving on. I'm hoping I'm I'm, I'm generating some controversy because I want a lot of good questions. Right, right, Suna. So um, Suna, Suna's going to be policing the um, all the questions. All right, next slide. BMI. This is what I was talking about. So how do you get BMI? BMI is your weight in kilograms or um, by your height in a meter square. Right, and this is where we get these measurements. And again, I they can be a little subjective, but the point is, I think it is a it's good to have an objective measure of how much fat you have. Now, you know, there, there are better ways of doing this. Um, usually, it's more expensive. You can do plethys plethysmography, and and um, you know, where you can send these waves through the body and determine exactly um, what is your percentage of body fat. I have one of those those uh, scans in my office, so. You can you can see how much muscle you have and how much fats in your body um, and, and things you can do the calipers. So there's, there's all sorts of way to measure. And, and, you know, in professional sports, they do this stuff all the time because you want to see how much uh, fat the, the athlete has. But BMI is a kind of a rough uh, way of doing it. And, and you do the height and weight. And like I said, 25 to, to 30 is overweight and obese is over 30. Plain and simple. Next slide. All right. Now, one of the things you need to understand with kidney disease is there are certain medicines that are that put you at higher risk and non steroidals do put you at higher risk of kidney disease. And and again, it's always surprising to me that some people are really abusing these medicines. And um, and their abuse of these medicines can lead to kidney disease. So if you're taking ibuprofen four or five times a day, every day, for, for week and week and week and month and month and month, you, this is very, very high risk. You know, a, a lot of our uh, people are taking these goody powders and they're abusing them. They're taking them every day. They have headaches or whatever. And, uh, you know, I would say if you got a headache every day, then you need to, you need some kind of workout. You know, it's not normal to have a headache every day or more than once a week, right? So you need to get that worked up rather than treating yourself because the treatment um, is, is a problem. That's not that's not that, you know, you know, sometimes people say the treatment is worse than the cure. Yeah, you need to figure out why you have these chronic pains and headaches and not take medicine that can that can hurt your your kidneys or even your GI tract. A lot of GI bleeding is because of the same these same medicines. Metformin, which is a medicine used to treat diabetes, can also be a, a problem for the kidneys and other there are other oral anti glycemic or uh, medications that, that that are also problematic. And you need to know that. And these are the sort of questions you need to ask. A lot of antibiotics can be a problem for the kidneys, right? So every, every medication you get from your doctor, first of all, you should understand why you're taking it. I mean, uh, and it, I know that seems so simple, right? I have had numerous patients. I will sit there with, and I have their medicine list and I'll say, oh, um, why are you on this medication? I don't know. You don't, you don't have my chart there, doc? Yeah, I have the chart. But you don't know why you're taking this medicine? Right? How can you be on a medicine that you're taking that, and you don't know why you're taking it? That To me, that's just that's just crazy. Right? So you should, no, number one, know why you're taking it. And then number two, you should know what are the possible side effects of the medication. What are the interactions of this medication? Right. These are simple things. And people people know more about uh, the television shows that they watch. They they buy. I, now, I'm a, I'm a I don't think my wife is watching. So I'm going to talk about her a little bit. So my wife thinks some of the people she sees on television, she knows. I mean, she's she'll argue with me. She's like, no, 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 no. He's not like that. No, 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 no. That's not true. I, I know that's not true because I know what you don't know these people. This is an actor in a movie, right? You don't know that person, but they know more about these people they're watching on television than they know about the medication that they're taking. You know, I'm sorry, I, just, I had to get on my soapbox there for, for a moment, but um, you know, I, hopefully my wife is not watching. I don't, I don't want to have to sleep on the sofa tonight. But uh, yeah, you need to know about your medicines that you're that you're taking. Next slide. Oh, okay. All right. If we get a Lisa Melanson from Baltimore, then we don't take that question sooner. 
I think that's the first question we have. I don't know about you, Dr. Melanson. I think that is the first question, but thank you so much, Dr. Melanson, for a great presentation. And I hope our audience truly, truly got as much as I did just sitting here um, for this amount of time. Um, and Dr. Callender, please, if there's anything that you would like to, to harp on, but so many good takeaway points, Dr. Melanson. Um, um, from this talk and a few things that just stood out to me. Number one, know your medication. I don't know if you saw me in the square over here just going crazy, but you know, we do a lot of outreach for the Ron and Joy Paul Kidney Center. And even individuals who are on high blood pressure medication who cannot say, this is what my normal blood pressure reading is, or this is what is not normal for me. And I'm on high blood pressure medication. You have to know why you're taking it and what those side effects are. We talked about BMI, anything over 30 audience is obese and it's coming directly from a surgeon. And that hinders in other areas, not just because it's a number, but because of health concerns and um, un you're a higher risk in many areas, including surgery. So that number means a great deal. Um, so let's, let's go to um, our platforms and see what questions we have. We have a question here from Kimberly, Dr. Monson. It says, I have been diagnosed with stage three CKD and taken metformin for type two diabetes. What alternatives can I ask my doctor about? That, that's a that's a great question. And we, we see people that are exactly in that situation, uh, Kimberly. And uh, the good news is, you know, within the last few years, there have been a lot of good alternatives. Um, the problem is, and this is <laughs> this is what you need to know: these great alternatives are expensive, and so your the type of insurance you have matters. All right, but there's a there's a whole group of medications that are oral that can be taken. It instead of um, metformin. Uh, but even if, and this is what patients don't, and I'm not saying this is going to happen to you, but even if the alternative is insulin, it's better uh, when now that you have uh, stage three CKD, it's better that you do anything to preserve the kidney function than you, that you have rather than taking any medicine that could hurt your kidneys. But, but yeah, um, the main thing is going to be to um, to ask the doctor what all the alternatives and then find out if your insurance company is turning turning down um, the medicines the doctors may may want to prescribe and oftentimes there are even alternatives to some of these 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 medicines um, you know now of course everybody's heard about Ozempic you know because people are taking it for um, for reasons beyond diabetes. Uh, so sometimes there's a shortage of, for people like you that actually might need it, uh, but it's very expensive. And, um, and so the, the insurance companies, usually what I have found is they're willing to work with the, the patients, but you may have to write a letter or make a call yourself. You know, and, I, and I guarantee you, I, I've seen this happen where when the patient calls and complains, um, it, it can carry a lot of weight with the, with the company. So, but again, it's about you taking charge of your health care. But yeah, you definitely, in, in my, uh, the way I look at it, you definitely need to come off metformin. What, what do you think, Dr. Callender? Yeah. I agree with you completely that uh, to get on a medication that is not nephrotoxic is, is very important. Yeah. Great. Um, Dr. Melanson, during your presentation, you talked about if you have CKD before it becomes end stage renal disease, that you can reverse it. Um, I want to bring this question to you, Dr. Callender. What can individuals do to prevent themselves if they've been given that CKD diagnosis from ending up in a, a end stage renal disease um, you know, category? Well, it's important to recognize that, uh, as Dr. Melanson said, it is reversible. Yeah. And so we need to find out what is the disease entity that's gotten you into the problem with kidney disease. So if you have high blood pressure, 
properly treat the hypertension. If you've got diabetes, properly treat the diabetes. If you're overweight, well, lose weight. Exercise and, and also change your nutrition. Less salt, less sugar. Uh, so those are the things that uh, are easily done to help you uh, stay at stage three or above and, and actually go from three to two to one. Uh, so that's my answer to that question. I would also add to the questions that you raise the fact that in people who are overweight, sometimes they can have uh, GFRs or glomerular filtration rates that are higher than 100. Hmm. And sometimes being too high is as bad as being too low. And so you need to understand that if you're obese, uh, you may have a, a GFR that's higher than 100, but that High, that ultrafiltration can hurt the kidneys as much as the uh, underfiltration. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Callender. And as we're winding down here, um, any final final message or words, Dr. Melanson, to our um, listeners? If you guys continue to share questions, we will address them and we will comment and make sure you get that answer. But um, any final takeaways that you have that you really want to make sure they, they hear the message for today? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think Dr. Callender just picked my my interest in this because he, I think he made an excellent point about about hyperfiltration and therefore proteinuria. You know, because a lot of these hyperfiltrating patients will have protein in their urine. So one of the tests you should always be asking about when you go to your physician on a yearly basis is, do I have protein in my urine? All right, and that's a very easy test, cheap test. And it's the earliest sign of kidney disease. So, uh, and Dr. Callender's right. When you're overweight, you can hyperfiltrate, and that's a problem. The other thing, you know, the liver made me think about this when you you mentioned obesity. And again, the number one for many years, the number one cause of liver disease. I mean, people needing liver transplants yeah. is obesity. Oh, fatty liver, right? So it's not, and it's not even just the BMIs over thirty. It's the diet that you eat eating a high fat diet. So I think those are the two, you know, take home messages I, I want to impart to to the uh, people out there in listening land. Wonderful. Yes. And, uh, point that I would make is that Dr. Lawson has emphasized time after time uh, is that the it's the change in the uh, BUN, the change in the creatinine, the change in the glomerular filtration rate that is important. And it's not so much the the, the number, it's the change in the number. And I think that's something that he's emphasized that uh, needs to be reemphasized. That uh, when you go to your doctor, ask him what it was last year. Yeah. What is it now? And uh, I think that he's, he's, he's emphasized it, but I, I, I think reemphasizing is not uh, uh, going to be hurtful. Great point. And thank you both so much, Dr. Keith Melanson and Dr. Clive Callender, pillars in our community and in the field of medicine. Thank you for taking time to talk about kidney terms that everyone should know. Um, I want to say thank you to BlackDoctor.org, to the Ron and Joy Paul Kidney Center, to MOTEP, the Minority Tissue and Transplant Education Program, and the Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church. This was Kidney Talks with BDO. We will see us again on November 10th, 2023. Please take this information and share it with someone in your community. Have a great day.